What's going on, everybody? It's Von Delzell here to drop some college football week one plays. Hopefully, you guys profit in week zero with me. Four and one, lucky to win the Rohemir Johnson play, but we will take it. All right, let's start off in the city of Pittsburgh at Akershire Stadium. We are going the favorites. Pitt minus six and a half. We may or may not have moved this line five minutes after I tweeted out the six and a half. Moved to seven and a half everywhere. All the sevens were gone as well, but now they're all alternative spreads, so you can buy back to the seven, which I think is the move. Now, why I like Pitt is everyone's saying, you know, no Pickett, no Jordan Addison. Hey, we all get it. I understand. But the fact of the matter is Pitt is reloaded. They have experience everywhere. 15 total starters back. They have one of the best D-lines in the country. They have a great defensive-minded coach. Their D-backs are going to be much improved. And then you look at the offensive side of the ball, they have more playmakers in West Virginia. Slovis coming in at quarterback. It's Signetti as the OC. He was at Boston College the past two years. He's a former IUP guy just like me. And – He's going to help that passing game out in some ways, in my opinion, because everyone's worried about the drop-off. I don't know if there's going to be a significant drop-off. And for JT Daniels, West Virginia has a great offensive line, but not enough playmakers for him to get it done. Letty Brown no longer in town. He did pretty much everything for them last season when they won games. So give me Pitt, minus six and a half. If this was a Week 10 game, I'd be on the dog here in a rivalry spot. But honestly, experience and coaching trumps Week 1, and I'd take Pitt on the touchdown. All right. Since Pitt's going to win the game and cover, we're going to take them in a money line parlay. We're going to throw the Duke Blue Devils in there. So this game, the Pitt game's on Thursday. This game is on Friday. Um, Duke plays Temple. We both know both programs are bad. We'll get to that in a second, though. But all three of Duke's wins last year came in non-conference play at home. Since 2000, Temple has lost 15 straight road games against ACC teams. I know Duke is not cream of the crop, but their offensive line does have 124 career starts among them. They should be able to move the ball a little bit. They are replacing a couple playmakers, but honestly, they were so bad last year. It can't be any worse. And uh, both teams score much more uh, when it comes to uh, non-conference play. We'll get to that in a second. Like I said, the only bright spot for Temple, Dwan Mathis, former Georgia quarterback. He's athletic. He may be able to create some things on his own. But the Temple defense, they don't got many guys back, and they're learning the new scheme for the second straight year that can wear on a team. Give me Duke and Pitt and Moneyline Parlay, minus 110 odds. Next play. We're going to go over 51. I was talking about how bad these teams are. Listen about this. Non-conference play, I pulled these stats. Duke averaged 38.7 points per game in four non-conference games last year. against Charlotte, NCAA, North Carolina, AT&T, Northwestern, and Kansas. They allowed 26 points per game in those games. At home, Duke averaged over 42 points per game in those three non-conference home games. Pretty significant. For Temple, they were all right. Now, they only averaged like, what, 14 or 16 points per game on the entire season. But in non-conference games, they had four of them. They scored 25.7 points per game, and they allowed 30. Those were against Rutgers, Akron, Boston College, and Wagner. All right, so, you know, I think both defense are going to be bad. And Duke has some very, very strong trends. When Duke is a favorite in general, just a favorite, the over is 13-2 and two in the last 15 games. When they're a home favorite. The over is 9-1 and one in the last 10 games. So very strong trends. I talked about this at 52.5. It's come down to 51. I played both numbers, so take the over 51 for one unit. Let's move on to Saturday. Saturday, pros versus Joe's game. I said this on my Twitter. North Carolina and App State, give me App State on the money line. Uh, I played them at 2.5 and, and on the money line, plus 2.5 that is. It moved down to a pick-em spot, plus 1 in some spots. UNC's defense looked very vulnerable against Florida A&M. I mean, they're going to have a team like App State come in there who has Chase Bryce at quarterback, quarterback, former Clemson guy, 3,000 passing yards over that last year. They got four running backs back. Um, you know, they got a committee, and then they have a good offensive line. All right, on defense, a lot of the Sun Belt experts said they have the best linebacking group and secondary in the entire conference. That's going to go a long way against Drake May, who looked great against A&M with five touchdowns, almost 300 yards. But going on the road to App State is going to be a whole different environment and situation for them especially when App State already has film on North Carolina's offense and defense from that game, especially what worked for A&M offensively against UNC. App State's going to use that and go a little bit further, all right? So my last point, North Carolina is a terrible road team. Five wins and 15 losses in their last 20 road games. App State is a terrific home team. 27 wins and two losses in their last 29 home games. Give me the home team here in a big spot where all the Joes are going to be playing North Carolina, all the pros are going to be playing App State. Give me the Mountaineers. All right, next game up. Woo, South Florida plus 12.5 at BYU or BYU at South Florida. We're taking the Bulls plus 12.5. Not your average South Florida team. According to Phil Steele, 
South Florida is the most experienced team in all of the NCAA. How is that possible? That's because the NIL. They got tons of transfers, including guys from Baylor, Clemson, North Carolina, Virginia Tech, Maryland, Kansas State, Wake Forest, and Minnesota, just to name a few, because there's plenty more, to be honest with you. The most notable guy, though, is Gary Bohannon, former Baylor quarterback. He was a big deal there. Um, he's going to keep them competitive all year long. And a lot of these guys are going to be very experienced, like I said. So South Florida is going to be much better than you would expect. And BYU doesn't want to hear that because they're 0-2 ATS the last two times they played them over the past three seasons. BYU also struggle, struggles as road favorites of 10 or more. When they're laying double digits, they're only 3-7 and seven ATS in the last 10. Uh, so I don't really want to lay the points with BYU, even although they could be a top 15 team, a top 10 team by the end of the year. They play a rigorous three-game stretch to open the season. And South Florida, who they think is going to be a cakewalk, is not going to be. So South Florida is going to punch them in the mouth. And the travel and temperature could be a factor, too. And Utah and Florida, it's both going to be around 90, 90-plus degrees on Saturday. But the difference is the humidity. Florida humidity is much different than Utah humidity. And Utah, it's going to be between 15 and 30 percent. And Florida, it's going to be between 70 and 80 percent. Huge difference. A lot of guys may not be, I don't want to say not in shape, um, but to play a full football game and be competitive and very physical. Uh, expect a lot of cramps, a lot of TV timeouts too. So give me South Florida plus 12 and a half and give me another underdog here. But this one we're going to play on the money line. We're going to play Middle Tennessee State getting six and a half uh, at James Madison. James Madison, JMU is getting their first FBS game. They're a Sun Belt team now. They were in the FCS last year and for a lot of years, but disgusting last year, 12 and two. Cole Johnson was their quarterback, 41 touchdowns, four picks. They had two linebackers at over 100 tackles each. Uh, but guess what? All three of those guys are gone. They're all gone. And when you look at what JMU has, they only have four guys back on defense starters and five starters back on offense. They're a totally new team. If last year's JMU team was laying six and a half in this opener as an FBS team to Middle Tennessee State, I'm laying it. But it's not last year's team. This is a new team. And you look at Middle Tennessee State. Well, before we get to Middle Tennessee State, James Madison gets a new quarterback, Todd Centennial of Colorado State. Uh, if you remember him, he lost his last six starts at Colorado State. In the last four games, he threw eight interceptions. All right, so this could be a fun game. And then for Middle Tennessee State, their quarterback comes back after an injury. Um, he had 16 touchdowns and three picks last year. That's Chase Cunningham. So, uh, you know, they get six guys back on defense, a handful of transfers ready to make an impact. And uh, in the last 13 games against some belt opponents, Middle Tennessee State is 9-4 and four ATS and on the money line. Give me the Blue Raiders, plus 6.5 and, and on the money line. Uh, one unit on the spread, half unit on the money line. Money line was plus 200 when I got it. I'm still seeing 190s floating around there. Last pick. Let's make this one quick. Um, it's hard to sell this one. Mac at SEC. I know. I know what it sounds like, but this is why I like Miami. So no Chris Rodriguez for Kentucky. He's a running back, 1,000-yard rusher last year. No Wondell Robinson, the receiver for Kentucky. He's in the NFL now. Those two guys accounted for 52% of the total offense for Kentucky last year. And Robinson in general accounted for 44% of Levis's completions. That's Will Levis, the quarterback for Kentucky. I think he's vastly overrated. Now he gets a week one opener against a pretty good Miami team with his two guys, his two guys he leaned on last year, not in the lineup. Uh, this is going to be a new situation for him. And they have, you know, a game at Florida on deck next week, too, in the Swamp. Very big game. Uh, Miami, Ohio, no slouches, like I said. Brett Gabbert, the brother of Blaine, is the quarterback. 26 touchdowns, six picks last year. They get nine stars back on offense. When Gabbert's on the field, 31.6 points per game they average. They average about 29 points per game in general last season. So he's a very big deal, and the offense is going to be good. The only thing keeping me from – making this a one-unit play is Miami is replacing four guys on defense that are key. They get some transfers in. They get some new guys coming off the bench, step in the starter role. But three guys from the defensive backfield went to the NFL, and one of their linebackers transferred out. Those four guys were big deals. So Miami should score, you know, at least 17 points. I see them scoring three touchdowns. Um, but Kentucky has an advantage. If they want to attack deep with Will Levis, it actually looks good. We'll see. Half unit on Miami plus 17, playable down to 16. All right, so those are my plays. Make sure you guys subscribe, uh, like, drop your locks, whatever. On Saturday at 11 a.m., we're hosting a show. Uh, that's my Pittsburgh accent. Uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time, Eric Froton, Brad Thomas, and myself. It's going to be very exciting, guys. So make sure you tune in one hour. All of our picks, we're talking about games, taking questions. Uh, we're answering your questions, Q&A. So uh, 
yeah, check us out, man. Go over the plays again. We got Pitt minus six and a half on Thursday. We're taking the money line with Duke money line for a Thursday, Friday night money line parlay. We are going Temple and Duke over 51. Then we are taking App State on the money line. We're taking South Florida plus the 12 and a half. And then lastly, Miami of Ohio plus the 17. Best luck with your plays. We'll see you guys on Saturday. This is week one action. And uh, early lean for week two, Florida's going to smack Kentucky.